Jesus loves me. I hope you all know the words to it because there's no screen this morning. But I'm going to come down and I'm going to sing it with you, okay? Everybody sing with us. If you all need the words, I print them in the, wor- in the bulletin. Jesus, Jesus. We'll sing it twice. Let's try to sing it twice. Yes, ma'am. Huh? I'm going to tell you in just a minute. You'll have to wait to find that out. But your, but your word is correct. Wh- Joanna wants to know why it's so bland in here. Perfect word. Perfect word. Okay. Ready? Jesus loves me. Can y'all do it? Everybody, right? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Let's do it again. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Y'all can be seated again, y'all can say, good job, thank you. Yes, it is bland in here, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Welcome, I'm, I'll, I'll stand up here so I can be seen. Welcome to everybody that's here in house, welcome to those of you who are watching online, and I think my camera operator is going to do a little pan to let you just see that there is nothing up here at all. This isn't a magic show. There's nothing up my sleeve. Um, there, 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 there's other reasons for that. I'm going to tell you about, um, well, I'll tell you more about it in the message, but, but there is a purpose for this, and I took everything away on purpose. And um, kids, so you'll just know, I'm just talking about we came to church to worship Jesus, and not, not that the other stuff takes away from that, but I just wanted to drive that point home this morning. So we got all that way. And that's why those of you watching online, you go, where's the music? We just, we, that, was, that wasn't all the music, but that was it. We're not doing anything else today. Uh, we are doing something else today. We're not doing all the instruments today. I do want to highlight a couple things. As normal, be sure to pick up your communion. We are going to do greeting time in a moment while the kids go out. And it'll give you an opportunity to go get your communion either up front or in the back corners. And have at your seat. Take a moment and do the tear off and let me know that you're with us today. Appreciate that very much. You will need a bulletin. Well, you don't, uh, the scriptures are printed in here for you. Don't have PowerPoint up there or anything today. And the words to the songs, if you don't know them, I picked songs that hopefully we all knew anyway and could sing without music. But if you don't get a bulletin, be sure to go back to the table and get one here in just a moment. Our Easter offering last week, we gave everything that we got on Sunday as well as anything that we collected online this week, which let me, I'll do another explanation for that in a moment. But it came to a little over $3,000 last Sunday that we're going to send to Haiti um, and to Obens and Joseph there. Um, because the way the dates fell, normally when the, when the month begins, whatever day that is, that money goes toward the next Sunday's offering. So if you look at the offering total, it says last week was twenty-one eighty-six. We we got uh, nine hundred dollars or something in online offering this week, which would normally go to this week's total, which will be in the record as this week's total. But those two numbers together is a three thousand dollars for Haiti. I know it's totally confusing. I wanted to make it that way. Okay, we collected three thousand dollars for Haiti. That's all you need to know. Okay. Speak. Speaking of. Um, Obenson sent a message back to the states to be, to be given to all the churches that support them. I'm going to read this. I put it in the newsletter, which is back there for you to pick up as well. But he says, Dear friends and faithful supporters, our kids are calling upon God for deliverance. The kids he's talking about is his school kids that uh, they, they teach. Um, you're probably aware of the escalation of the chaos in Haiti. The United States government sent their Marines to secure their embassy and, pro- and proceeds with the evacuation of their citizens. Other countries follow the United States example. We and one of our schools are 22 miles from the U.S. Embassy and half a mile from one of the most wicked gangs stationed. 
that sometimes interrupts the school close by. But in the midst of the furnace, our God is walking through the fire with us so we don't get burnt. So far, we are safe. Keeping us in your daily prayers is what we currently need the most. Thank you very much for it. God is good all the time. I want to share that with you from Obenson in Haiti. Um, also, uh, if you want an Easter lily, we, we did not do dedications or anything, but um, they are in the fellowship hall next door. If you like to get them each year and plant them, please go next door and take one because we have no further use for them. Um, so take an Easter lily and take it home if you would like one. The new church directories are available. Yay! Um, they're on the table back there. Please, one per family. If you've got to have two, you can have two. Uh, the second copy is $500 a piece. But help yourself to them. Also, the April calendar news is back there for you to pick up. I'm going to go ahead and mention our prayer list now because uh, I'm not sure how the end of this is going to go today. Uh, Larry Couch had surgery for his gallbladder. He did very well. He's home today. Uh, but keep him and Carolyn in your prayers for that. Uh, Frances Belk, I got to see her uh, this week. She is doing good. She talked like she was going to be moved from Cortland Terrace to another uh, assisted living home. But I do not have that information yet. She was still there yesterday. Okay. So keep Francis in your prayers, but she was doing good. And then Shane is having surgery on his foot this coming Wednesday. That is not on the, on the prayer list, but uh, be aware that Shane's having yet another. I think he said his 15th surgery, but not on his foot, but in total, but uh, having surgery on his foot uh, this, coming, this coming Wednesday. So now our students and teachers can be dismissed to their classes. Y'all can stand up and say hello. There's no music to call you back. You just have to listen for my voice to, to when greeting time's over, okay? Get your communion, wave to the camera. We'll continue in just a moment. I'll just get me some water. You didn't interrupt me. <laughs> Good to see you all. Okay, come on back in, have a seat. As I mentioned, and you can plainly see, things are a little bit different this morning. And if you're tuning in for the first time online, or if you're visiting with us today, uh, this isn't an apology, but 
Um, if you're sitting there thinking, you know, why can't I come to church one time when they have a normal Sunday? Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. But um, what I'm doing is, is, is on purpose. So I don't want to apologize for that. What we're doing today, and, and I'm really excited about it. I did this 11 years ago. Um, in, in fact, when I went back and pulled up the message, we had done a special offering for Haiti that same Sunday that I did it, which was, was, was really cool. Um, but I also feel like I should repeat this every few years because I, I just feel like it's that important. When I preached this before, I did a two-week series that I called Reset. Uh, the first one was titled Pause back then, and part of the idea is that we just needed to take a break. We needed to stop what we were doing, take a pause, and, 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 and reset some things. Not because we had lost a, a lot of stuff, but, um, well, it was just needed. Today's message I've reworked into a new series that I'm calling His Church, and we're going to spend the next few Sundays talking about the church. Note the front of your bulletin. I put the, the, the verse or part of the verse there where, where Peter is confessing that Jesus is the Christ. It says, on this rock, the confession that Jesus is the Christ, I will build my church, Jesus says. I love my church, this, this church, as many of you do too. You're a great bunch of people. I, I, I love the decorations that are usually here. We have some ladies who who make sure that we have uh, uh, flower arrangements uh, here and, and everything looking very nice. Bob and Carol usually keep our banners uh, updated for the season. They, they take care of that for us, and, and, and I love that. And you can hear an extra echo in here, but you don't realize that when you take the chairs out from up front and the banners off the wall, we got a little extra reverb in this room. Um, we have several families and individuals who volunteer to clean our buildings each week. And I appreciate that. And they did clean this week, by the way. I didn't tell them, don't clean. We, well, we still want the building clean. But um, I, I love our praise band and all the, 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 the parts of it and the people, uh, how, they, how they lead and sing and how y'all sing. Um, I love how you love each other. I, I love that Gaston Christian Church is a special place and it's special to many of you. But I also love and, and want to remind you and be reminded myself that Gaston Christian Church is just a local congregation that is part of the global church, the kingdom of God, His church. We, we play a role in that, but we're part of something bigger and it all belongs to Christ. This is not my church, even though I referred to it a moment ago that way. It is not your church, although you have possession of it as well. But the reality is, it is His church. And this whole series, and today starting it, is to remind us that this is His, not ours. This morning's message and this minimalist approach, that's what one of my preacher friends called it when I said something to him the other day about it. He says, oh, you're doing a minimalist Sunday. Um, it's designed to remind us that, or, or why we are here. Last week we had a great Easter service. Had a lot of people, several of you, your families came to share Easter with us. And Shane sang a great song, as did the quartet and the men's trio. Uh, and and y'all singing and the worship songs was, was fantastic. It was great. It was an awesome day. It really was. And you know, let me be re real clear right up front. There's nothing wrong or detracting from the things that have been taken away or the things we did last Sunday. Uh, the piano and the horns and the violin and the guitars and the drums and, and the worship singers. Uh, the banners, the flowers and the decorations or the PowerPoint or all of that stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. And I've, I've taken it all out. I even took out the, the chords and the... The music stands, the podium, there is no clutter. It's bland, as Joanna rightly observed earlier. 
These things are not evil. They're not wrong. They're not even or should not be detractions from worship. There's nothing wrong with, with, with any of them. Worship singing is certainly not distracting. It's commanded by God. It's what we are supposed to do. And, and we're going to sing a, a little bit more in, a, at the end here. But I wanted to strip all of this away to make a point and hopefully make a lasting impression on you. I want to do this by telling you uh, uh, three Bible stories, beginning at the Old Testament book of Job. And a lot of people use the phrase, the patience of Job, and that's really, that, that really does not describe well what takes place in Job's life. But there's a lot that, that's going on. We're not going to have time to, to discuss Job. I did a whole series on Job a few years back. Um, but I do want to focus in on, on something about it. In a nutshell, Job was a righteous man who feared and honored God. And Satan asked God for permission to test Job's faith. And God gives Satan that permission. And in one day, Satan tested Job and he lost his barns, his cattle, his fields, his children. All wiped out in, the, in a matter of moments. One after another, servants rush into his presence and tell him. First one comes in and says that some, some raiders, some Sabaeans, had come and, and attacked and killed some of his children and his servants and, and some of his cattle. And while that servant is still speaking, the next one comes in and, and tells him of a, the news of a fire that fell and devoured his barns and some of his, his cattle, his sheep, and his, some of his other servants and I am the only one who escaped, is what each one of them says. And as soon as he is finished speaking, another servant comes in. And the Chaldeans had, had developed three raiding parties. And they came and they took your camels and they took your servants and they struck them down. And I alone escaped, he says. And then the last servant comes in on his heels and says, The rest of your children were at your oldest son's house having a celebration when a, a giant wind came and collapsed the house upon them and they're all dead I alone escaped bang 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 just like that Job lost essentially everything here are the totals 11,500 livestock all of his servants except the four that escaped with their lives to tell Job the news Ten children, seven sons, three daughters. Just about everything he had. In fact, it's not really an exaggeration to say that Job lost everything. And to make sure you understand the point, all of the things that Job lost were blessings from God. He did not acquire these things through nefarious means. He was a righteous man who feared God, and God had blessed him. Which is why Satan says, take it all away and he'll, he'll curse you. Okay, that's, that's the backdrop. So in that day, in that moment, he finds out all of his things are taken away and his children have died. How would you react? How would I react? Awfully, I'm sure. Don't know if I could withstand such news. But, but here's how Job reacted. Job chapter 1, starting at verse 20. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, that's his symbol of mourning, and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Job was distraught, to be sure, crushed, hurt, grieving. But notice his posture toward God. He fell to the ground and worshipped. Again, there's a lot more to this story of Job and the book of Job than we have time for today. But I just want you to think about Job's reaction when everything he had was taken away in an instant. He bowed low to the ground. And he worshipped. You got that? Everything was taken away. Everything was gone. Like our stage. Everything was gone. And Job's response was to worship. 
and praise God. All right, hold that for a few moments. I want to go to the New Testament, the, the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 9 is where we're going to be in a few moments. I'm going to read verses 7 and 8 in, in just a minute if you want to turn there or have your bulletin open and follow that. Jesus is in the midst of his ministry. Actually, it's, it's kind of winding down, and the time for him to go to the cross is drawing near. And as part of preparation for that, Jesus withdraws from the crowds. He goes off by himself. In fact, he goes off from even his own disciples, except he takes along with him Peter, James, and John. And they go up a high mountain. And there on top of the mountain, Jesus is physically changed. His appearance has changed, uh, 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 transformed. The, the biblical word, the old biblical word is transfigured. The figure of him was changed is the compound word meaning there. His, his, his face shone bright white and radiated. His clothes became white like lightning and radiated. In, in short, he took on the appearance that he would have had in heaven. And, and Peter, James, and John are there. And God causes a, a deep sleep or a trance to come over them while they're up there. And, and coming back from Sheol, from the place of the dead, are Moses and Elijah. And they talk to Jesus. Now, I, I think that's the only thing that the Bible says is they, they talked or, or, or something like that. But the idea, I think, is that they encouraged Jesus ministered to him in preparation for him going to the cross. As that time was winding down, Peter, James, and John wake up from their sleep, from their God-induced sleep. And they see Moses and Elijah back from the dead. Now, just make sure you understand this in case you're, you're not familiar with timing of the Bible and everything, Moses had been dead for some 1,500 years and Elijah for about 800 years. So Peter, James, and John would not have known who they were save for the fact that they knew who they were, okay? Uh, which there's a whole other lesson on there about knowing people after they, they in heaven and when they died and all that stuff. But they recognize it's Moses and Elijah. Anyway, here's the part I want you to think about. Peter... Feeling the need to say something in the moment. He blurts out, this is uh, Mark 9, 5. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three tents. One for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I mean, why not? It's Moses. <laughs> He's the one who got the Ten Commandments. He was the one that led Israel out of Egypt. He's a great figure. That, in fact, the whole Old Testament law, we call it the law of Moses. Okay? Cool. And Elijah, he's the one who fought the, the priest of Baal on Mount Carmel and won. So this would be really, really cool. We'll build a shelter over here, and we'll put Moses in it. And we'll, we'll come over here, and we'll build a shelter for Elijah. And, and we'll even put you in the middle, Jesus. We'll build a shelter and put you in it, Jesus. Cool, right? By the way, Mark, in his gospel, and um, we, are, we, are, we are very confident that Mark got his information from Peter. There's a few things in Mark, and this is one of them that kind of lets you know that Peter was involved in the writing of it. Peter kind of makes himself look bad and makes a little excuse for himself. Mark tells us that Peter was terrified and really didn't know what to say <laughs> when he blurts all this out. Well, he didn't blurt all that out. I kind of extrapolated a little bit or dramatized a little bit. But anyway, that's the scene. Jesus, Moses, Elijah, and Peter has made a motion to build three tabernacles. For each of them. One for each of them. But there's no second to the motion. In, in fact, here's the response. Mark 9, starting at verse 7. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them. But Jesus only. 
There's more to explore to this story, just like the story of Job. But I want to point out what God says. This is my son whom I love. You listen to him. Elijah was a great prophet. Moses was a great leader and deliverer, lawgiver. But do not think for a moment they belong in the same category, on the same level, sharing the same stage with Jesus Christ. And God himself splits open heaven to make that point. Peter's like, let's just tabernacles. And God, who rarely speaks from heaven in this way, very rarely, chooses that moment to say, hey, no, right? Moses and Elijah have incredible lives, incredible stories, and there's a lot that we can learn, and we need to learn from them, okay? But they are not on the same level as Jesus Christ. Not at all to be confused or mixed in together with him. And after God splits the sky with his voice, James and John and Peter look around and everything's gone except for Jesus. I, I love how Mark wrote that, or the, the translators have, have translated what Mark wrote. And, and, and he says there at the verse, end, end of verse 8, um, if I can find it, there it is, but Jesus only. They were all gone, but Jesus only. All right, recap so far. Job, when everything was taken away, worshipped God. Peter, when he tried to put Moses and Elijah on the same level as Jesus Christ, was firmly and loudly corrected by God. This is my son. Listen to him. And everything is gone except Jesus only. All right, now I want to take you to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Last story I want to share with you. Paul and his companion at the time, Silas, are in the city of Philippi. And there was a, a young girl who was demon-possessed, and the demon gave her the ability to tell fortunes and tell the future. And her, she was a slave girl, and her owners were making coin off of her like crazy, okay? They were using her and her demon possession, and Paul delivers her from the demon, but the owners are not happy about it. In fact, they cause a riot, they get Paul arrested and Silas arrested, and they take him to the magistrate who strips them, who beats them, and then puts them in jail. And not just any jail. And, and do not think about our American jails. I don't know if any of you have been in jail. Um, and I, I have I've been in, not, not, not resident, but, but they are clean. <laughs> um, and, and there's a, sub, a thing in America called civil rights. And even inmates and, and prisoners have rights, especially in America. Do not think about that kind of jail. This is a Roman jail, prison. And Paul and Silas are not putting, put in the pen out in the front of the jail. No, they are taken to the inner part of the jail. Maximum security, where it's dark. And not just that, they're not just put in the slammer and the gates shut. They are put in stocks. They have their hands and their feet shackled while they're in the inner part of the jail, this Roman jail, where it's dark and dirty and dank and stinky, and there are no human rights. And they're cuffed while they're there. Very bleak, very dark. You got it, okay? And, and why are they there? Because they have delivered... A young slave girl from her demon possession. They weren't caught shoplifting, okay? They're, they're not in jail because they did something wrong. They're actually doing God's will and God's work. And that's why they are in this place. Naked, bleeding, bruised, locked up. Okay, do you, you got the picture? Did I paint it well? Maybe not, but hopefully you, you filled in the blanks, okay? Acts 16.25. About midnight, 
Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Can we just show a hand? Don't no, show hands. I'm going to say it, but don't do it, okay? Show of hands. <laughs> You're in jail. Let's say, let's, I, don't, I, I hate to pick on Turkey, but let's call it a Turkish prison. That's just what came to mind, okay? You're in a foreign land, Turkish prison. You got not jaywalking. I don't know what for, okay? And they throw you into the dungeon. They strip you naked. They beat you. They lock you in stocks. It's midnight. It stinks. You're uncomfortable. How many of us are going to go, hey, I think this is a great time to pray and sing. Jesus loves me. You know, who's going to do that? Paul and Silas, that too. They sing. They pray. Everything had been taken from them, including their freedom. They are not comfortable. They are in pain. And remember, they're not there because they did something wrong. They're there because they did God's work. They're there because by the power of God, they delivered a slave girl from demon possession. They've been doing what God wanted, and this was their reward. And so they worshiped. There were no comfortable seats, no heat, no air conditioning, no banners, no PowerPoint, no worship leader, no piano, no drums, no horns, no guitars. They couldn't even clap or tap their feet because they're locked in stocks, okay? But still they prayed and they sang and they worshiped. Now I'm not saying that those things are, are bad, the comfortable seats or the, the praise band or a comfortable worship place or the PowerPoints. They're all fine. They don't even really get in the way of genuine worship, or they should not. Okay. But it is easy for us to fall into a place where church is fun because of what we get out of it. We get to see our friends. We get to laugh. We get hugs. We get to talk to people and get people to talk to us, and we, we get attention. We sing songs. Sometimes we even get to sing songs we like, right? The preacher makes us feel good. We have this nice place and all of this nice stuff. Oh, and we get to worship God, too. Hey, Jesus, I got a great idea. Let's build a tabernacle for the praise brand. Let's build a tabernacle for the decorations. And, and while we're at it, we'll build a tabernacle for you too. Okay, I'm being a little over the top and dramatic and facetious and all of that. But do you see the point that I'm trying to get to? God, it's good for us to be here. And oh, oh by the way, we get to worship your son too. Let me ask you a question. It's, and it's a trick question. Okay, it, it is. I'll, I'll warn you up front. But I want you to answer yourself honestly. And it's not to guilt you or anything. But, but hopefully it's to help you remember something that's very important. When you first came in, what was your reaction when you looked up here and saw everything gone? You might think, you know, we've been robbed. <laughs> Did you have a moment when you realized that the praise band was not going to play? And, and did you feel let down? And it's okay if you did. I'm, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm really not. Okay, it's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to set you up to snap the trap on you. I'm, I'm, I'm not. Because I, 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 we need to look forward to worshiping and singing and, and all of that. We, we, we really do, okay? But I want to point out something to you. Not everything's gone. The communion table is still here. And the cross is still there. And, and don't think the cross is there because I, I was too lazy to get a ladder and take it down. Because, I mean, if you think about it, and, and if you look back there, you'll see the fact that Brian came this week and broke his drums down and put them away. And we rolled the piano back there. 
and I took everything down. Don't think I would not have stopped at the cross if I had wanted to. But I left it up there for very, very good reason, purpose, and illustration. And the communion table too. Sunday morning worship serves many important functions. These are talked about in Scripture. We, we need fellowship. We do. One of, one of the big reasons for the church, and, and it's going to come up in this series, is the fellowship that we have. And, and God knew that we needed each other. Love one another. He says a gazillion times in the Bible that we need one another. Fellowship is very important, okay? Teaching. We need to be taught God's word, especially in a world that doesn't value it and needs it desperately. God's people need to know what he said to them and why he said it. It is vital that we get that teaching here and that truth. Singing and worship, it, it, the, the Bible commands us, sing songs. We are supposed to sing and worship. God inhabits the praise of his people, the Bible says. We need to pray together. Our offering is part of worship. All of these things, and, and, and maybe a few more, are good, and there's nothing wrong with them, and they're, they're not hindrances. In fact, they are integral parts of worship. A part of God's plan and purpose for the church. But, and, and we cannot forget the one reason we do gather we cannot forget the primary reason that we are here. Have you ever gone to the store to get one item, a loaf of bread, perhaps? And you go in and you, you go to the checkout line and you come out with two, three hundred dollars worth of groceries. Because three hundred dollars is not out of the, the picture anymore. And, and you get home and realize, I forgot the bread. I forgot the one thing I went to the store for. I'm not saying that we do that or have done that. I'm not beating you up or accusing you, but I want to make sure that we take time and not forget the bread. Do you see what I did there? Okay. I wanted to make sure today at least that, that we know why we are here, who we came for. I, I've seen this, I, it's, a, it's a joke, it's a meme on, on the internet a few times. It goes something like this, uh, uh, somebody in church is going out greeting the preacher in the back, and, and they say to the preacher, you know, I really didn't like the music today. And the preacher says, that's okay, we weren't singing to you. All of this that, that's missing is just window dressing. It's nice and it's good and perhaps helpful, but it is not primary. We gather because of and for God. We sing because of and for God. We pray because of and for God. God, we read scripture, listen to preaching, have youth programs, clean the building, plant the flowers, staff the nursery, teach the children, play instruments, have communion, all of this because of and for God. We cannot, we must never forget that. So if you catch yourself thinking, I do or I don't like something at church, that song, the color of the seats, the temperature, the activities, whatever it may be. Can you please remember that's not the primary reason why we come? It is not for our personal enjoyment and pleasure. Job was a man richly blessed by God. But his blessings were not the source or even the foundation of his worship. His faith in God was. 
Peter, James, and John were privileged to see Jesus in his heavenly state and, and to get a glimpse of two of the great Old Testament figures in Moses and Elijah. But they were thoroughly shown that nothing and no one shares a spot alongside Jesus. Him only. Paul and Silas were not too downcast, not too tired, not too beaten, not too uncomfortable to worship. In the midst of their prison cell, they prayed and they sang. Today, I just want to ask you to stop and think about why you are here and why you come each first day of the week. To ask you to remember that it's not about the stuff as good as it is. It's about Jesus. You know, I, I always want to end the service or at least give the opportunity for anybody who has never confessed Jesus as their Lord to do so. If you've never been baptized the way the Bible teaches, we want to give you that opportunity. In fact, I, I, I warmed the water up. Um, if we have a baptism today, we're going to have a little army of guys. We're going to go out there and clear out the, the side room so we can get to there. But we will do that if we need to. But, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing, um, I love you, Lord. We'll sing it through twice. I'll lead us in communion. And we're going to sing, I exalt thee. And while we sing, I exalt thee, if you need to accept Jesus as your Savior, if you're ready for that, you can do that at that time. And we'll go from there, okay? So let's sing, I love you, Lord. If you, if you need the words, they're in the, the bulletin printed there for you. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. To worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound. In your ear. Would you pray with me? God, our Father, we are so grateful for your Son, Jesus Christ. Who he himself gave his life on the cross. Let his body be nailed there on our behalf. Let his blood be shed there. For our forgiveness. Fathers we remember that today. As we take the bread and the cup. Let us be mindful of his body. Both the one that hung on the cross. And his body of believers. Who have gathered to honor him. And follow what Jesus instructed us to do. And remember him in this way. May you bless it to us. In our spiritual bodies. That we may know. You and of your love and of your mercy and of your greatness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the bread together. Let's take the cup together. Thou, O Lord, art time above all the earth. Thou art exalted.
exalted far above all gods. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, O Lord, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, O Lord, for thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. Would you stand and sing, we exalt thee? We exalt thee. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. Oh, Exalt thee, we exalt thee, O Lord. Would you bow with me in prayer? God our Father, may we always be mindful that you are the one and only reason that we gather. To honor you, to lift up you and your son, what you did for us, what you continue to do for us. And Father, though um, in your great mercy and grace, you give us so much. And there is so much more that takes place when we come together. We are grateful for that as well. But let us not forget Jesus only. Keep us safe as we go home. Father, we pray for Larry as he continues to heal, that um, he would get his strength back and may join us again and uh, watch over and and bless him. Heavenly Father, pray for Shane and his surgery this Wednesday, that it would go well and correct his foot yet again and maybe this time be uh, the last and let him have um, some healing and relief from all of that. We pray for Frances as she continues to get her strength back and heal from her uh, broken uh, hip and leg, uh, that you would uh, just be with her. Thank you again for Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today. You get to go home early. How about that?